the second round table, so it's not a panel this time, but a round table. So I would like to give more room for discussion and questions from, from the audience. And uh, so welcome to the second round table of today. It's called De-Risking Strategic Autonomy and Economic Security. It's uh, my great pleasure to be chair of this distinguished uh, panel, and I'd like to introduce in the order of appearance uh, Mr. Gabriel Felbermeier. He's director at VIFO, or the Austrian Institute of Economic Research. Welcome. And uh, Deborah Revoltella, she is chief economist at European Investment Bank. Welcome. Jose Rama, Deputy Director at the National Office of Foresight and Strategy from Spain. Welcome. Otilia Dant, Director, Institutional Relations at Temasek. Is that correct? And uh, Marek Mora, Deputy Finance Minister of the Czech Republic. Welcome. So just to give uh, a short introduction into uh, this roundtable's um, topic, I would like to... Uh, to to um, to go come back to to the title of um, the dialogue con of continents, and it is called de-risking the transition to a new globalization, and that to me consists of three parts. The first one is uh, new globalization that implies obviously the idea of a new equilibrium or a new global order, mm -hmm. and of course the question arises what kind of uh, new global or geopolitical order do we have in mind? So do we talk about uh, two blocks under the leadership of the US and China? Or do we think more uh, on a polycentric or multipolar geopolitical order? The second part is the transition. So obviously we have a transitory path towards a new equilibrium, a new order. And the question arises, what does the transitory period look like? So do we have multiple uh, equilibria? So is the transition to a new geopolitical order stable or instable? And what are the factors depending on? And the third part is the de-risking. So what does it mean? What are the measures, what are the formats of cooperation and autonomy we are pursuing in order to strengthen sovereignty and de-risking supply chains? And uh, I think um, the most striking um, fact of this transition to a new global order is the fact that we are heading from a cooperative uh, game to a non-cooperative uh, game. So the, the, the rules of the games are changing. And under this umbrella, I would like to talk about three things. So what is the new uh, geopolitical order, according to your assessment? Secondly, what are the new formats of cooperation and autonomy we need to pursue? And thirdly, more with regard to Europe. So it's, I think it is obvious that we have accumulated a strategic deficit, especially in Europe. So what are the more general lines of conflict? Is it Europe against the new global south? Or is it the US versus China? Uh, and what can be done in Europe to remedy the strategic deficit we have accumulated over time? So uh, that's for the introduction. I would like first to give um, the floor to you, Gabriel Felbermeier, for short introductory remarks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I was saying that I'm grateful to be here and uh, thankful to the organizers of inviting me. I've uh, recently co-authored a, a study for the uh, German economics ministry uh, in German, but there's also an English version of it. Uh, the idea is to come up with uh, guiding uh, principles, Leitplanken, as, as it says in Germany, guiding principles to improve 
security of supply in Germany and, uh, and in Europe. It is all, it's all been motivated by uh, the discussion that we are having uh, about the new geopolitical order, or maybe to be more honest, going back to the old situation, uh, systemic rivalries have been rather the rule than the exception, uh, except from the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, from the 1990s to 10, 2010. Huh? This is an exceptional period of time. And uh, uh, the question is what to do about it. And uh, uh, the strategy now uh, adopted the European Commission or, or in the, the China strategy paper by the German government uh, or also by some at least think tankers um, and parts of government uh, in the United States is it's not about decoupling, it's about de-risking. Yeah. You know? And so I'm, you know, it sounds much nicer to decouple than it, so it sounds much mu nicer to de-risk rather than uh, to decouple. Decouple meaning that we're really cutting uh, bilateral relationships with, uh, with trade partners. But of course the question is what uh, is is uh, what uh, could the risking actually mean? What uh, uh, what uh, form does it take? And as economists would also ask the question, why do we need government action at all? Right. So uh, enterprises, firms, deal with risk all the time. Uh, they've done so in the past. Now the risk landscape has changed. There's more geopolitical risk. There's also maybe climate risk that um, threatens supply chains, well, supply networks, and firms need to take that into account. And the question is why do we need new government paradigm, maybe subsidies or import tariffs or other forms of government intervention. And of course we would, as economists, look for market failures so that um, maybe firms diversify too little, they take too much risk. Or we would also search for mm, government failures. You know? Uh, and saying maybe the situation that we see of excessive risk taking is due to misled or miscalibrated government policies. Now, if you take economic security concerns out of the equation for a second, it is not clear whether firms invest enough into diversification of, this, of their supply chains because diversification typically costs money. You, so you source from your second or third or fourth cheapest supplier, and that's a costly option. But of course, firms also know that there's risk and that a supply relationship can break down, and it's a very good situation to, to be in if your rivals uh, don't get supplies, but you get supplies, no? because that will allow to charge higher uh, prices and benefit from higher profits in a, in a supply. Uh, crisis. And so recent research, very recent research, uh, argues that uh, there can be a consumer surplus externality. So firms, when they're not able to, to produce, that's bad for their profits, but they do not factor in that it's also bad for the utility of consumers. Mm -hmm. But there's also the possibility that firms actually invest too much in uh, diversification because they all want to be the only firm that's able to produce if a crisis hits. Well, and so, as so often, the theory uh, yields ambiguous results. But there are additional uh, factors that, that lead firms to diversify too little. One is that um, you know, the conventional way of thinking of economists leads economic security questions out of the equation. And here we have a public goods problem, because uh, individual firms do not factor into their individual decisions what their sourcing or you know, also uh, selling decisions imply for economic security. So even big consumers of Russian gas probably have said uh, over the last years before 2022, we know that there is an aggregate over-dependence from, from Russian gas, but if I change my sourcing, that will uh, mean I, I have to buy higher LNG prices, uh, pay higher prices for liquid natural gas, but my individual decision changes very little on the overall security situation for Europe. So it's a public good problem. There's too little investment into this. The second problem is, is that there is probably uh, government failure or the government actions uh, lead to too little diversification. Two problems. First problem is a moral hazard problem. Firms uh, can expect that uh, when they have trouble, when they cannot produce, there will be some sort of policy 
put into place that helps them. No? Uh, short, short work schedules, for example, no? a Kurzzeit, uh, that allows firms to keep on their workforce and but not need to pay them. And that means when the, the risk materializes, uh, firms can uh, can push some of the risk uh, to the to the taxpayers, no? and that means they take too much of it. And the second problem is um, that um, there's always the danger of um, taxation of so-called excess profits. No? Once uh, uh, a firm has prepared for the crisis and the crisis happened, and other firms have not prepared, then that firm that has prepared makes higher profits. Right? If you are the only one to supply consumers. In the face of a supply crisis, of course, you charge higher prices. Now, if we take those profits away, and tax them away, and firms expect that, there is not much to win from being the only one uh, to, to be able to serve the market in case of a crisis. Uh, that means that ex ante, your incentives to diversify are smaller. So it's not just about market failure. There's also government policy issues that, that, are, that are troublesome here and that we need to rethink. Yeah. Now. De-risking means, for me as an economist, one thing, and that's diversification. No? So that's how we deal with risks. We diversify. And so there's a couple of things that we should, that we should uh, derive from that. First of all, because we don't have an infinite amount of sourcing possibility, you cannot fully diversify. Some risk remains, and that's okay. Mm? The second thing that one should note is that um, uh, if, if countries uh, specialize on certain segments of the, of the goods spectrum. No? So we, we, don't, we don't produce everything, the division of labor is efficient and useful, then this specialization usually follows the structure of comparative advantage. No? So we do not specialize on certain areas because it doesn't make sense to specialize on those certain areas. Another question is, what could industrial policy do? Is it uh, clever to subsidize firms in those areas where there is no comparative advantage to produce? or would it not be rather better to say we should use those resources and strengthen those, those areas where we already have a technological lead and invest, if you like, if you, if you allow me to say so, into the reciprocity of a relationship so that we are uh, able to, to, to um, exert pressure on a trade partner that uh, behaves non-cooperatively uh, uh, because we have uh, areas where our uh, technological situation uh, is, uh, uh, cannot be circumvented by others. The, other, the third problem with, with this diversification problem is that we have um, uh, too little information. No? We, in this, in this uh, study we discussed at length that it's very difficult to come up with lists of goods that need to be protected or where we need to have some you know, strategic uh, storage because what's scarce yesterday is super abundant today. No? We have pork cycles, no? Schweinezyklen as we say in German. In the chips industry it's very visible, high prices followed by periods of very low prices. No? This is risky for the taxpayer to, to wade into that um, and uh, the problem is that this, in, this type of intervention typically comes late. So you know, we, we put the money into the field when prices are high and then access or additional production comes uh, online when prices are low, no? depressing them further. So, then what, what's useful to do is to generate a, an environment or contribute towards an environment where general principles are put in place that make sure that firms have enough um, incentives to diversify, to de-risk, also in the face of geopolitical risk. And governments should facilitate that, for example, by concluding free trade agreements. Mm. So I'm a trade economist, I've always liked free trade agreements, and I don't like the situation that we have today, that they have fallen into, into this way. That's the only way uh, to, to generate legal security, not full security neither, but it contributes to it. Then what we should also do is, uh, besides concluding those agreements, we should avoid counterproductive actions. I already mentioned excess profit taxation, not a good idea if you're really interested in firms to, to deal properly with risks. We should also look into legislation such as the corporate sustainability due diligence directive being prepared by the European Union like now, if you uh, put a lot of burden on firms in monitoring their supply relationships, there is some risk that they withdraw from certain relationships and that uh, this is not good for diversification. I think this CSDDD uh, 
instrument that's being prepared is very useful. We should have it, but we must make sure that the negative consequences are dealt with. Or we should, um, we should uh, take the single market uh, and see it as the best option to insure against risks, uh, in making it deeper, more dynamic. For example, in the area of uh, capital markets is, is a priority, and I'd much rather like deepening the single market than erecting new uh, fences or, 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 um, or, or uh, obstacles at the border. And finally, something that we ask for in, in our study is that we really need amongst the 27 EU countries to harmonize our policies in this area. We are calling for something we call ESO, European Supply Security Office, uh, not an agency. We had some long discussions about that, but then we concluded no agency, please. An office that makes sure that the countries uh, enact uh, policies that do not contradict each other, that are consistent with the single market, and where we have common rules, for example, to do stress testing of, uh, of uh, uh, supply relationships, something that the uh, first pieces of EU legislation already ask for, like the Raw Materials Act wants us to stress test, but it's open how to do that, on what basis, what is the information, and how are we uh, making sure that we are doing those stress tests in the same manner across all member states. So that's... Um, that's a bit of uh, my first uh, contribution. And if you are interested in the study, let me know. There's a German version that's online on the German ministry's website. And there's also an English version that I can send you if you're, if you're interested. Thanks. Thank you very much. Just to, <coughs> just to clarify some of your thoughts. So I do understand, of course, that firms are able to diversify some supply chain risks on, on a firm level, of course, on a microeconomic level. But in case of night and uncertainty, so how can we deal with uh, black swan events? Well, no more one can. More no one can. Pardon? Nobody can. Nobody if can. It's, if okay. it's truly night uh, then uh, what we, the only thing we can do is, uh, is, uh, is uh, build resilient uh, structures you know, that can deal with all sorts of shocks, whatever they are, unexpected or expected. <laughs> and that means... Uh, uh, a, a, you know, this is exactly what we are after. No? So general principles that, um, that help firms uh, cope. No? And uh, um, you know, what, what we believe is that, um, that uh, ad hoc interventionism is certainly not the way to go forward. No? Because that will probably exacerbate problems, increase volatilities. No? And um, uh, when we talk about supply security, it's almost always in, at least in think tanking uh, environments uh, where I move, no, it's very often about the physical delivery of goods. No, but then we talk to central bankers and their worry is about prices. And if we think about what moves, uh, what moves uh, uh, the policy around, it's prices too. No? So, so the question is, is uh, what happens to prices really, rather than quantity. I mean, these things are related, but what, you know, it's not so much that there's uh, too little supply of this and that, which uh, bothers the public. It's the fact that you go to the supermarket and you get what you want, but you get it at twice the price. No? And here too, the, the, the question is what, what helps us digest those shocks? No? And then we talk about competition policy, we talk about entry into, into markets, uh, we talk about the right incentives. No, these are, and even in the Nightian case, I think that's what should be done. The rest is, to my understanding, uh, risky. And obviously, or for very good reasons, uh, not really uh, you know, efficient from an economic point of view. Thank you, Deborah. Now we're interested in your perspective <laughs> on uh, de-risking, resilience, and all those uh, issues from the perspective of the European Investment Bank. Please. May, um, Thank you very much, and I very much uh, I will follow very much in line uh, with uh, with uh, what uh, you just said. And actually, I very much uh, share the view that uh, you were putting in the table. And I think uh, we are in a very difficult moment uh, at the European level because uh, uh, Europe has uh, to decide uh, on topics uh, on uh, open strategic autonomy, industrial policy. In the moment in which the, pro the, the pressure, the external pressures coming from this, uh, this uh, the globalization are uh, uh, very strong, and the risk is uh, 
also of having a non-aligned uh, responses from a human member state. So it's a very tough uh, moment uh, that uh, um, that has to be managed uh, in the pro proper way, also in terms of uh, coordination among uh, member states. And I think uh, that uh, uh, papers like the one uh, that we are uh, uh, preparing and discussing are very, very important also to, to, to get a common framework for thinking uh, at the European member among the member states. The main challenge was uh, starting, I think, uh, uh, the, the wake-up call was uh, probably in terms of industrial policies uh, and open strategic autonomy was uh, coming from uh, the Inflation Reduc Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act, uh, which uh, came out uh, particularly in, in terms of uh, the green transition as a wake-up call uh, for uh, Europe of uh, policies uh, on the US side, uh, where you also saw a lot of uh, um, domestic content in production uh, that are questionable in terms of uh, how much protectionism was coming uh, from the US side. Now I think there is uh, a little bit less attention on the detail of the Inflation Reduction Act. I think uh, Europe had a lot of uh, rethinking of uh, what we are doing on our side on how much the subsidies and uh, the local content uh, that is in the US is uh, really uh, matched uh, by national EU instruments at the European level. And, uh, I think uh, in the discussion uh, with the U.S., uh, the understanding is, yes, maybe U.S. measure was not ideal in the way in which it was uh, introduced and the local content size, but uh, at the end uh, may not be excessively damaging uh, for Europe uh, in the moment in which uh, at the European level uh, we also have a mechanism to support our industries on the one side and also on the other side in the US side uh, the, the measures are very effective uh, but uh, they pose uh, a questioning in the, in the way in which they are structured on the continuity of uh, the financing uh, for the Inflation Reduction Act. So companies on the US side are questioning uh, whether if they intervene today and uh, if the financing uh, will last at uh, the next uh, budgetary rounds. So the, the measure, uh, let's say, the comparison, uh, comparison in terms of a measure is, uh, is a li little bit less uh, favorable. Um, on the other side, uh, um, the wake-up call uh, brought uh, Europe to rethink uh, whether uh, uh, particularly in the green transition, uh, this, the, the scheme of uh, policies uh, that we have implemented at home are effective and efficient enough. And what we see is uh, that, in fact, uh, if uh, we compare uh, the performance at the European level, uh, you see that uh, European, Europe is uh, quite uh, strong in terms of innovation in the green transition. It's, uh, uh, but uh, the challenging uh, part is not uh, really too much coming uh, from the US, it's very much coming also from China in some of the industry, where uh, on the green innovation side uh, there is uh, a very strong uh, pickup. And also you start uh, seeing uh, in terms of uh, uh, investment activities on the green side, uh, China very, very strong, uh, also Europe uh, very strong in terms of uh, of uh, investment activities, and this reflects also in terms of uh, trade dependencies, in which uh, you see also some uh, more trade dependency on the green side uh, uh, emerging, uh, also with uh, China rule uh, growing. So at the end, uh, the rethinking that was originated from the Inflation Reduction Act uh, actually brought uh, Europe to rethink about uh, the rule of China more uh, and uh, thinking uh, trilaterally, not only Europe, uh, U.S., but Europe, uh, U.S., uh, China, in terms of uh, uh, the green uh, uh, innovation, green uh, trade, uh, green production, and green competitiveness. If uh, we have to think about uh, how the policy at the European level uh, should be structured, I think there are a few elements that need to be there. On the one side, and uh, you were talking about where the market failure are, are I think the first market failure is the traditional one, is an innovation, and that their policy can really go trying to deal with innovation, traditional innovation market failures. So their 
support for uh, the addressing uh, the market failures uh, can be designed. It's already designed uh, both at the national and the EU level. I think uh, there, uh, there is a risk that uh, too much goes back to the national level uh, rather than the EU level. And that's uh, something uh, that uh, at the European level, uh, we should uh, not allow uh, uh, to happen because uh, this uh, will uh, weaken uh, intra EU competition and at uh, the end uh, will uh, weaken uh, e European competitiveness. So there is uh, some discussion, and now it's a little bit vanishing, but uh, there was a lot of discussion whether Europe should allow more exemption uh, to the stated rule uh, to allow more uh, subsidies at the national level to take place also in innovation. I think uh, the more we can scale back this pressure, the better it is for European competitiveness uh, overall. This is one point. The second point, I fully agree with, with, uh, with you on the diversification side. There may be another market failure in terms of uh, diversification of companies. And I think uh, one element that you probably didn't mention uh, is uh, the reputational effect uh, for firms. So you may have uh, the incentive uh, to you diversify enough. You mentioned the taxation part, that uh, if you raise a the price, uh, they may tax you. But it may also be the case, I think, at the COVID, COVID vaccine, you have uh, the vaccine uh, and you say, now I am the only one having it, I can super price it and have uh, huge profits. You can't. In some, uh, in some situation, uh, you have a reputational rule and companies uh, for reputational issues may not uh, take this. And then at the end, uh, they, diversify, they don't diversify enough. Ex ante. So on the diversification side, I think uh, there is a room uh, for uh, some, uh, some intervention. I agree there is a room of uh, potential, some uh, um, rule on the raw material side. And I would add it also in terms of energy market. So um, at least uh, ener with uh, raw materials, uh, but also energy, I think uh, Europe uh, would benefit uh, much more having a more aligned uh, energy strategies and energy market uh, development. And I think uh, the last uh, element uh, that I fully agree is uh, that is a huge opportunity for uh, rethinking at the advantage of the European single market. And I think that has to come back because the European competitiveness is also competitiveness of the European single market. And there is a, a lot of untapped potential to rise at the bar of European competitiveness doing more on the EU single market. Mm -hmm. so if I understand you correctly, you are your, um, how can I say, um, vision of, um, or, or your, your idea of de-risking is a mixture of competitiveness, uh, innovation, and also autonomy. Is that correct? I think, uh, I think uh, uh, de-risking is a part of a strategy of European competitiveness. And uh, it's part of a strategy that include uh, more focus on innovation and support to innovation, uh, support to the risking as well, and uh, support on uh, making uh, the European single market more, uh, more efficient and effective in order uh, to boost competitiveness. And that uh, will help uh, reposition uh, Europe in terms of global competitiveness. I see. Thanks. Jose, your director of the National Office of uh, Foresight and and strategy, do you see more than, than we do? And uh, do you have better strategies <laughs> for the transition for what you see and nobody else sees? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me, Mark. Thank you for, for, for taking into consideration the work that we are currently doing. Uh, today I want to uh, outline, uh, or briefly outline, uh, because I just have seven minutes, uh, the, the report that we conducted during our uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union. So I want to follow Gabriel talking about uh, our book. So <laughs> this is uh, our book. <laughs> um, you also can check uh, it, it uh, online. Okay, the name is Resilient EU 2030. So as you may know, uh, in, Juli in July 20, uh, 2023, Spain starts with the presidency of the Council of the European Union. And one year before, President Sanchez uh, um, uh, posted the idea 
of develop a theoretical approximation to uh, the concept of open autonomy strategy. This is, uh, for us, something very relevant uh, because it follows the, the idea uh, also underlined by uh, President von der Leyen on the importance of be open, but also uh, uh, try to identify our risks, our vulnerabilities, our third country dependencies, etc. So in July 2022, uh, we start in a conversation with the uh, 27 member states. Uh, thanks to the foresight network of the European Commission, led by Sefcovic, we start this conversation and we uh, were able to engage all of the member states in this project. It was the first time that the 27 members participate in a, in a foresight project together. Uh, so um, the, the main idea was to focus on four areas. The area of health, of course, because of COVID. Uh, and we very, very much know and we learn uh, the relevance of uh, strategic plans, etc., in the area of health. The second area is the area of energy. Uh, take a look to the uh, war of R Russia and Ukraine and the, and the concerns regarding energy. The third one is digital, the digital area, and the fourth area is the food one, the food and agri-food area, and uh, the focus on the uh, food security uh, uh, topic. So with these four areas, we were in coordination with country member, uh, with the expert story of country member states. And during one year, we started in September 2022, and the inform the report was presented in uh, July 2023. So during one year or near to one year, we were working together on identify our vulnerabilities and dependencies, and then on um, uh, outline some uh, solutions, or at least map some, uh, some ideas regarding how to tackle all of these vulnerabilities. We start with a quantitative approximation, and this is something very relevant because thanks to the work of DigiGrow, we identify th more than 300 products uh, in different areas that the European Union is vulnerable, is fully dependent from third countries. Take a look, for, for example, that we import, that the European Union imports 79% of lithium from Chile. We import 97% of magnesium from China. We import 99% of boron from Turkey. We import 86% of phosphorus from Kazakhstan and Vietnam. So we are uh, fully dependent in some raw materials, but not only in raw materials, but in processing goods uh, from third countries. So this is not a problem per se, because you know this is the mutual relationship, and this is normal in, the, in an open trade. But if we move to a much grimmer multilateral, uh, uh, multilateral scenario, we need to be prepared. The, Euro the European Union needs to be prepared, and that's why we identify at least uh, uh, three areas of, of action. We consider that the solution to tackle these vulnerabilities is the solution or the umbrella of the open strategic autonomy that was defined by the European Commission <laughs> as act, act, act autonomous when and where nece necessary and with partners whenever possible. So this is basically the idea. The idea is to uh, develop three, three, three actions. The first one is bolstering and securing internal production capacities. Uh, we think that uh, we need to foster our production of components and assemblies of green technologies, thinking on the energy sector. We need to improve the internal capacity in digital services, <coughs> take a look or think on the artificial intelligence, but also on quantum uh, computation. Think as well on uh, our dependency on chemical fertilizers for the agri-food area. <coughs> Think as well on our dependency on uh, APIs in the uh, health sector. We also need to boost uh, our innovation. I think that we are in line with the works of, of Deborah. Uh, we need to uh, boost innovation, like, for example, in, in the area of chips, uh, Europe 
needs to, to take more actions there. Strange the integration of the single market. This is very important in terms of you know, our internal decisions. And finally, we need to develop contingency plans in sectors like health, but also in sectors like food. We have a contingency plan in the health sector, but we do not have it in, in other sectors that are uh, strategic industries. Uh, and we need to identify these strategic uh, industries. The second area of action is enhancing circularity and smart consumption. So this is basically the idea to, to focus on, on our circularity me measures. Uh, so the first thing is uh, uh, resource efficiency. We need to uh, you know, uh, uh, all uh, um, use all of our of our power in, in this direction. Uh, for example, data from the uh, food sector. Uh, every year, 50, 59 million tons of food are wasted in the EU. Uh, so we need to reuse it for the fertilizers, but also for the feed industry. This is uh, very very uh, important. We need to foster. Uh, uh, the circularity in all of uh, uh, our industries. Uh, finally, but uh, not less important, we need to reinvigorate the global trade and the multi multilateral system. Uh, we are facing now uh, the moment to take actions regarding uh, di the diversification of partners. Uh, as, as I previously said, we are fully dependent on uh, different uh, countries for different uh, uh, raw materials and, and services, etc. So we need to identify it and we need to diversify uh, our partners because it would uh, uh, be uh, it will be possible that uh, the Europe uh, uh, is more more stronger. So uh, basically, the idea that uh, we uh, we outline in the uh, EU 2030 report is to um, not to be naive, not to be naive, um, following the direction that the European Commission, but all uh, the uh, member states are doing, try to identify those strategic areas where, uh, where in the future we will be more uh, uh, dependent uh, and also uh, um, anticipate the risks in all of these uh, of these areas. Thank you. Okay, one one more question, following uh, Jacob Frankel, <clears throat> I would like to ask: de-risking from what? How mm -hmm. much do we really know about future risk and and shocks? Yeah, I Can we really use use or or think of anticipatory measures dealing and coping with those shocks and risks? Yeah, that's a very, very good point. I think that you start with a good claim, uh, identifying the risking with diversification. And, uh, and, uh, and we, follow, we follow this idea. Uh, we follow the idea of uh, assume the risking as a diversification, right? Uh, and in this fourth area, the areas of energy, health, food, uh, and digital, we, uh, if we move to a more fragmented, polarized world, uh, we need, Europe needs to uh, be more, let's say, autonomous in, this, uh, in, in at least some, some of these areas. For example, if you take a look to the uh, CPUs uh, in the digital sector, uh, the, storage, uh, the, the storage elements, or if you take a look to drones, etc., we import more than the 50% 50 per, 50 of drones from third countries. The same applies uh, in, in other services or in other technologies. Um, so uh, we need to stretch our internal, internal market. We need to stretch and um, follow a, a European vision, right? We need to stretch these this strategic, uh, let's say, markets, these strategic areas uh, whenever it's possible. Because uh, being more competitive, uh, we will be more strong. So this is basically the, the main idea. Now we're interested in knowing your take on de-risking in, so in a fragmented global economy. Please. Thank you, Henning. Um, I'll start with the uh, introduction to Temasek so that you all understand what our point of view is and then move on to Henning's question about what kind of world we expect to, to face and how do we prepare our portfolio uh, for that future. 
And at the end, I would really like to share with you our wish list of what de risking should look like uh, to maintain as much as we can uh, from the globalized markets. Um, Temasek is a Singapore based investment firm. We're not a fund, we do not collect money from other entities. We invest from our own portfolio, whatever we divest, we're then able uh, to, to invest further. Uh, we're um, a global entity in many ways because 30% of our portfolio is Singapore based, 24% is invested in the United States, about 20% in China, and about 12% in the EU, which is growing in, uh, uh, among our investments. Jose will be happy to hear that our investment priorities globally are energy transition, digitalization, healthcare, and agri-food. And these are pretty much the areas that we are investing in Europe as well. Uh, we invest in and with entities like BlackRock, uh, particularly in decarbonization, and with entities like uh, European uh, Innovation Council in digitalization. Now, the way that my colleagues are now asking me to analyze what we're going to face is whatever the changes you're describing, what does it mean for our 2030 portfolio? Where do we invest uh, to make the best of what, we, what we're seeing in the world right now? And my best answer is that as in any other transition, we only really know what we're transitioning from, not necessarily exactly what we're transitioning to. But more and more, we're starting to see the contours of what that future world is likely to look like. And if the political scientist in me wakes up, uh, I would say it's probably polycentric rather than multipolar. Uh, but that may be uh, just, a, just a minor distinction and it wouldn't say anything to my investment colleagues. What they need to know is that we're probably looking at a greater fragmentation and a greater barriers to both trade and investment in the world in the next sort of you know, five to 10 years at the very least, and then we'll have another look. Um, but what we're currently looking at is the triangle of our major investments between the United States, China, and Europe. And what we have focused on was to identify what is the likely feature uh, of that triangular relationship in future and what does it mean for, for our portfolio. And we're working with a base case that we will probably see a de-risking rather than decoupling alignment uh, in scope between the United States and Europe whereas Europe is going to be slightly slower in implementation, but pretty much the same on the policy outline uh, when it comes to trade and investment vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, what that means for us is that we need to start being slightly careful because in investing in certain areas, in certain geographies, may get us into trouble in other geographies, which also requires um, a slightly different set of skills among the investment professionals to be able to identify and be sensitive to the risks that they may be facing with the investments that they are making. Uh, what I'm talking about is, for example, uh, the increasing barriers in uh, foreign direct investment. So in Europe, a good example is, uh, if you go back to 2019, there were six then eight countries in Europe that had foreign direct investment uh, screening mechanisms. Then there is a new uh, directive that comes in 2020 that creates a rule on the EU level and gradually individual member states uh, start defining their uh, screening mechanisms. And now we're up to 22 out of 25, I believe. And that is 22 different frameworks that our uh, legal uh, colleagues have to take in regard whenever we're deciding on various investments across Europe. Because oftentimes, when we make an investment in a company that that's based in the EU, it will have bases in various uh, other member states, and all that needs to be taken into account. So that's one practical implication. Now we are looking at uh, the review of this particular framework, which we hope is going to be in our favor, that it brings more harmonization, it brings more transparency and collaboration among the member states. Because for us, the worst of all worlds is that we have 22, 27, God knows how many various frameworks we, we have to comply with. It is much more convenient for us if we have one and we can work with uh, one entity that helps us to define what is it that we need to report to get uh, a sign-off for our investment. And then the next one we're watching out for is uh, the initiative for outbound uh, investment screening, 
uh, from the European Commission, which is expected uh, sometime towards the end of this year or early next year. Not necessarily because as a Singaporean in entity we would expect to be captured, but in many ways to see whether that scenario of alignment between the EU and the US on uh, trade and investment policies vis-a-vis -vis China is actually playing out. Uh, because if we see an alignment in scope of uh, this um, invest, um, investment screening tool uh, with the executive order in the United States, we'll make a little tick and our decision tree is going to move towards the scenario that, we, that we're expecting. Then we're also ch looking at the changes in supply chains, but I won't go into that because that has already been discussed. Um, the return of industrial policy. Well, that's an interesting one because it really... Um, the rise of, uh, um, of the new policies towards creating national champions, uh, towards uh, creating strategic industries that get uh, more convenient treatment uh, with permitting, for example, or, or a subsidy programs. That are, those are all things that change cases for investment. Not necessarily the subsidies, because as a long-term investor, you do not want to rely on subsidies, because you never know when they are removed, um, and the business case needs to, needs to make sense on its own. But it certainly does create uh, changes even within the single market in the EU, because if you have a look at the individual member states, they have very different firepower when it comes to supporting uh, their uh, you know, companies within, within their scope. And that actually threatens the rise of imbalances in, in the single market. To give you one example for all, it's actually the CHIPS Act. Uh, if you have a look at, let's say, Ireland, which has very well-developed uh, semiconductors industry, the Irish government is not able to put on the table the same level of support as, for example, Germany or France can. Uh, and the risk is that the smaller countries in, in the EU are going to lose out on these policies because of the, the lesser firepower by definition. So these are some of the things to watch out for. And what it really means for a long-term investor like Temasek with 260 billion euros of portfolio and 12% of it invested in, in the EU is that our portfolio needs to be resilient. It needs to be resilient from just simple Sim simply structural perspective, but also from the perspective that takes in regard the likely changes we are going to, go going to see in, uh, in the global political structures. And uh, just to finalize that, if we had a wish list of how to de-risk European economy without necessarily damaging or fragmenting uh, the global trade, it would be three things. Define what is strategic and devise the rules that protect uh, European critical supply chains, infrastructure, whatever you choose it to be. Uh, but resist the pressure to define everything and anything as strategic because it brings certain conveniences or advantages uh, to businesses and individual sectors. Then protect the level playing field. It's good for everyone to protect the level playing field from damaging foreign subsidies, from state aid in other countries, from simply unfair competition. And then the third one, let everything else be. Thank you. Short, Thank you. Thank you. short question and um, please uh, short answer. Uh, sure. So capital markets are engaged in efficient risk sharing. To your assessment, uh, to what extent capital markets already reflect uh, premia on risk, uh, on de-risking strategies? Can, you, can we say that? <sighs> or, or do they count on governments to, to bear the costs of de-risking? Honestly, we're all still flying at least half blind uh, because it is not clear uh, what are going to be the actual policies because they are still just shaping up. Mm. Um, and that's the most difficult period because when you're waiting for things to shape up, there are certain steps you can take, but they are probably not perfect to what eventually materializes. Um, if we do not know what policies are even going to be implemented within the ne next 18 months or whether they even materialize in time, we can only count them in in a certain way. And looking and talking to colleagues, we're still only finding our way around it. So perhaps the right answer would be a little bit, uh, but I think we don't think we're there just yet. Thank you. Marek, you are Deputy Finance Minister of the Czech Republic, and uh, in Germany we have had recently the judgment of the Constitutional Court 
uh, and uh, while well saying that we need to, uh, to be aware of the debt break. And uh, I, I do not want to repeat that discussion, but uh, are there, from your perspective, um, specific uh, perspectives from, from fiscal policy on, on de-risking? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Henning. Uh, I will also maybe start with a small personal note. Um, in 18, 1989, I was 18 years old, so I started studying at the university. Vienna was the place which was the, the west for me, you know, the first place, the big city where I came was to Vienna. At that time I was twice here in 91, 92, I think in the summer school, once by the University of Vienna, the second time by the Wirtschaftsuniversität at Wien. At that time it was a dialogue between the west and the east. Now it's more between the north and the south. <laughs> I always had to tell our Viennese colleagues and friends that, you know, Prague is to the west from Vienna. Well, sorry. Um, but it was also a time when I, you know, how the way I learned about Jacob Frankel, not only that he is an excellent professor of economics and he wrote many pieces about monetary policy, international financial order, but at that time I read uh, his papers when he was, and sorry Jacob, if I am not, I think it was 1992 where you were, when you were uh, the chief economist of the IMF and he wrote many papers about the way our economies should transform in the, the market economies. And what I wanted to say that many of these things, the, my dreams which I brought from Vienna and the things I read in, in Jacobs are under uh, uh, danger now. And this is, of course, something which uh, we are worried about. And for me, a question is really how a small open economy, middle income or between middle income and, and advanced economy should behave in this world. And I think to understand that, we should first understand the, um, make, make a right diagnosis of the situation. For me, the the first big shock to this uh, uh, globalization process which started or which was accelerated uh, after 89 was really China. And I don't know exactly when, I think it was probably the first decade after 2000, after China became the member of WTO, uh, when we understood that basically the integration of China into the world uh, economic system did not succeed very well. I mean, we all benefited from globalization. We can see the rate, the poverty rate going down substantially in the world, and mainly in China. Uh, we also benefited in the Western world from this process. We benefited as consumers, but we not all benefited as workers, especially the low-paid workers did not necessarily benefit from that. And on the other hand, uh, so this was the you know, partly success story, partly maybe a threat, but the other part of the threat is that China really um, did not play by the rules, by the WTO rules. Uh, it's an autocracy, and I think we can understand it, and many people do understand it, and many politicians do understand China as a potential threat uh, also uh, uh, in terms of, of our business relationship, economic relationship, in terms of being able to weaponize its economic potential against us. So China, number one. Then we had this series of polycrises. Uh, well, some people call it now polycrises, which I think is a nice word, and we had them, many of them, especially here in, in Europe. You know, it started with the great financial crisis, it, the, then we had the euro crisis, then many people forget that we had terrorist attacks, 2012, 2013, 2014. We had the first Russian aggression. Uh, we, had the, we had the migration crisis. And all that together, in my view, I'm sorry to say that, uh, uh, maybe as economists I shouldn't be too normative about it, but as a person I am, uh, you know, the way how we are using social media, all that created and also the way globalization happened and the way that we were not able to compensate these low uh, income workers for their potential losses created enormous tensions also within our societies. And that's why and it is the second, in my view, second big game changer after China was the United States. And the election of Trump. Again, I don't want to be too normative about it, but obviously, you know, they, there was a political demand for this kind of a leader in the United States. We should understand why it was the case. Uh, but for us in Europe, there were many question marks after Trump was elected. You know, is still the United States a pillar of a liberal economic order or not? Is it still a pillar in the NATO or not for us? Is it still our friend or not? 
So there were many, many question marks. And then also the way uh, you know, the United States adopted its economic policies, you know, many features of protectionism, some of them that could be well explained, mainly by the threat of China, but some of them may be a bit less, and we should also not forget that many of these things were then continued after the Biden administration on the CHIPS Act, the uh, IRA Act, uh, everything uh, uh, which was done recently goes basically in the same direction, so it's about the US, it's not only about Trump, and we should also not forget that after that, this poly crisis continued or even uh, got worse with COVID, with inflation, with energy prices, and with the second aggression of Russia. I mean, uh, when I mentioned the first aggression, it was Crimea. Now, uh, this uh, second aggression of much bigger uh, size. Uh, another wake up call uh, for us, especially in Central Eastern Europe, goes exactly to Germany. I think we also see or saw a change in German economic policy. Germany, which was considered by many as a, you know, we have always, someone already mentioned this Rhine divide in Europe between France and Germany. Germany was always considered to be the liberal bloc in the EU, or more liberal if you want it. But now I think in recent years we, see a, we saw a change there as well. Uh, if you see, if you look at the massive uh, subsidies mm -hmm. German government is giving to, you know, basically to private companies. You know, Intel, uh, they offered something to Tesla, which Musk then refused to take. Uh, it's enormous. Uh, the Institute für Weltwirtschaft Kiel, they publish every year something called a subsidy report, or maybe I'm not precise. One was published very recently. And if you look at the figures, normally Germany gave over, you know, the last decade something like 5% of GDP to various financial supports. Last year it was 6.2, for this year it should be 9.7% of GDP was the estimation of Kiel. Uh, and there I come to your question or to the point with the German Constitutional Court, which I think, well, I, I don't know what I think, but it seems that uh, these subsidies will be somehow limited or maybe even stopped to some extent, that the way German economic policy was done in the last years and the plans which were done for this year could not be realized and the plans for next year neither, but this is something uh, what we will see. So, you know, China, United States, Russian aggression, Germany, what could we do about it? I think we have to do some homeworks in the EU internally. I think we should speak or talk about, you know, what is the European Commission about? What do we want it to be for? We had a political commission under Juncker. We have now a geopolitical commission under von der Leyen. Mm -hmm. I have a big question mark about it. You know, commission is, European Commission, for those of you who are not from the EU, is the highest competition authority in the EU. The competition authorities are outside of the political business. Do we want to have this? And they, they are very powerful in this. Do we want this competition authority to be in a political body? I don't know. If you look at the way the European Commission approached the Stability and Growth Pact or the adoption of fiscal rules, I don't know how many of you will remember Thomas Wieser certainly will. I don't know how many years ago when Juncker said, uh, you know, Juncker which violate, uh, sorry, uh, France which violated many fiscal rules in the EU, Juncker said about it, ah, c'est la France. So we will not make any proposal about the violation of the, of the French, by France, of the fiscal rules. So do we really want this? So my first thing should be, we should really start talking about this, how, for what do we want this institution to be? We should also speak about policy, about uh, diversifying our energy resources, about making or strengthening single market, both in energy fields, which is kind of very technically not easy question, but also uh, we should still continue to work on, our, uh, on the strengthening of our capital market, which is very difficult, especially if you don't have many strong capitalists within our individual countries, uh, uh, but still we should work on that. Externally, we should also try to, I think, re-establish, I know it will be difficult, but we should start, to, uh, and this would be for me a geopolitical commission, to re-establish or try to re-establish whatever the leadership in the US will be, our transatlantic relationship, which I think is absolutely key. Uh, and we should also try to help to change the WTO rules so that the WTO has such rules where all of us feel somehow 
happy about, uh, including China. It's, I know it's, again, very, very difficult. Uh, I don't know if you know the very recent book by Andres Sapir and uh, a Greek colleague of him, whom, whose name I forgot. Uh, they wrote a book about how the WTO rules could be changed exactly to also to accommodate maybe for, for Chinese uh, specific features. We will see. Uh, we should also insist, and there I get back to what Jacob said, I think we also see that many institutions simply do not stick to their mandates. I think we should really st uh, insist that the ECB, its first business is inflation, uh, price stability, and less you know, gender issue, climate policy issue. The same applies to the IMF. Uh, so these are things which we should really work about, but for this, we would need a kind of, as I said, um, at least agreement, at least a broad agreement with the United States, otherwise we will not be able to do that. I spoke about the WTO, which should be changed as well. Again, I know that I say it very generally, not easy to say, or not easily to be done. Uh, some ideas by Andres Sapir, as I said, uh, the Director General of WTO, she speaks about reglobalization. Uh, we should maybe, uh, you know, start thinking about other areas, other member states, other states, uh, and to integrate them more into the global, global scene. Uh, you know, we as the EU have tried for 20 years to negotiate the business uh, agreement or trade agreement with Mercosur, with Latin America, which should have been signed on Thursday. I read today morning that Madame von der Leyen will not go there, that it will not be signed again. So these are all failures on which, on which we should collectively work. Um, I know that I was uh, a bit general with the solutions, but I think for a small open economy, you don't have any other chance but to stick to this global economic order. If you have a disorder, you are basically lost. It's not, it does not only apply to the Czech Republic. I think it applies also to Austria. Maybe some of my ideas are a bit incomplete, maybe a bit naive, but I wanted to say that I think it was three years ago when the president of one uh, globally systematically important country said, that NATO was brain dead. I wouldn't say that NATO is brain dead today, so we should maybe be equally optimistic about the global economic order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And before opening up to the questions from the audience, I would like to ask one more question. And I started by saying that we are probably moving from a rules-based to a power-based global system. And de-risking, or the need to de-risk, may result from, uh, from the absence of, of rules. Uh, mm. So we do not play according to the same rules any longer. So Gabriel, do you, do you think we have any heuristics or institutions that we can trust, that we can build on, uh, or tr trying to replace those missing rules? Ah, that's a very difficult question. I mean, if it, I know the WTO quite well. Um, there's, we have a theory of the WTO and the GATT, no? by Backwell and Steger, two game theories that have you know, shown us why the system worked. No? Because there is no, there has never been an international body that enforces international law yet. Mm -hmm. for, for four or so decades, the WTO GATT system worked. Now, I don't go through the maths of this, no? this is something for graduate students, but but what uh, what transpires very quickly is if you you move that game into a zero sum environment, all these nice propositions and theorems and lemmata and corollary all, all go up, nothing works. Uh, and so the there is a deep problem, and I think what one needs to the, the best hope that I have is that we need to go to to the United Nations, you know, where the where a, 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 a holistic view is uh, is uh, better placed. The WTO was charged with a silo. To, talk about trade and, and you take keep all the other stuff out. I think that doesn't that doesn't work. So I mean that would be interesting to think of two Nash equilibria and it depends on what we are doing, uh, which one is uh, is the one we we can achieve. So if, if you if you allow for zero sum uh, considerations in the GATT and WTO framework, uh, we don't even have there's not just a question of uniqueness but even of existence of equilibria. Mm -hmm. So it's we're in deep in deep trouble, the WTO, I think, is n cannot be saved, except if by some miracle uh, we are back in, in, a, in, a, in a world where trust is restored, where, or where we have a liberal hegemon like the one we had for, you know, for mm -hmm. 
for the Western world, no, the Eastern anyway was for four decades excluded from it. So, but these are things that I don't foresee. So I, I guess we, we need we need to there really needs to be some very deep thinking, and one cannot just say let's take let's hope that WTO works again because it won't. I mean, there are logical problems why it won't, and uh, maybe the the idea of uh, of the International Trade Organization, at the very, you know, which was part of the Bretton Woods uh, Compact, no? uh, but more politicized, m more closely integrated into the United Nations, maybe that is something like that. So we need to take security concerns into the WTO. But if we say security, we, s we say zero sum. No? Someone threatens, someone wants to impose its will on the other, this is zero sum. And, uh, and for this we need, we need, I think, very different, very different uh, um, Set uh, of rules, so there's. A f I don't see any cheap, any cheap remedy really. Mm -hmm. no. But Hill, you're talking. Uh, you you, you touched that point. I think uh, the return of industrial policy, and we have seen. I'm um, looking at Harold James that uh, industrial policy l historical uh, very often led to protectionism and renationalization of economic policy. Is that a, a threat? to to an open global economy, the return of industrial policy. I mean, the idea of a triangle of geopolitics, security policy, and industrial policy. So the US, I think, uh, always thought or brought that together in a triangle. And in Europe, we, we missed that. Uh, but uh, more a threat or an opportunity to, to gain autonomy? In many ways, it is a risk. Um, at the end of the day, EU has been established as a trading bloc then, that then developed into, into something larger, but we thrive on trade. But the trends that we have seen recently, even before the return of industrial policy, was already raising a red flag of potential descent into protectionism. And this has to do particularly with the new rules that we're putting on European companies in terms of, and they're all, you know, I'm all in support of them. It's just, you know, it has side effects. So, you know, the new rules on, let's say, safety, uh, on data, on uh, um, green credentials, uh, the forthcoming uh, corporate social responsibility directive is going to put a strain on businesses to comply. It all costs money. And uh, <laughs> the European Commission recognizes and the member states recognize that the increased cost almost inevitably put European enterprises at a competitive disadvantage to the cheaper competition. So that's why we get more and more extraterritorial uh, proposals from the Commission, for example, on uh, the Corporate Social Responsibility Directive that captures non-EU entities so that companies globally are driven to comply with European standards in an effort to make the European standards into global standards so that everybody competes on the level playing field. Now, if we don't succeed, then there is an increasing risk of uh, protectionism. And that is just compounded with the industrial policy and the, and the sort of the push uh, to build up, let's say, national champions or, or, or locally based enterprises. But to me, the very fact that there is a perception that uh, with the new rules that, we, uh, that we're imposing on European companies for very good reasons, then there may be a competitive disadvantage if this doesn't happen. We have a good chance of that happening where we're the first movers, let's say, on artificial intelligence. Uh, but there are many other areas where we're not necessarily first movers or have good chances of establishing golden standards. So, yeah, this is one of the things that we're watching out for. I think, Mark, we have 15 minutes left f um, to the lunch break, so I would like to open up uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, and please introduce yourself very briefly and ask uh, your question, and please uh, say to whom it goes, please. in which we might see progress. And I'm sorry, Jonathan Granoff, I'm the president of the Global Security Institute. Um, the International Convention on Arbitration, often known as the UN Convention, is what has allowed, in the post-Cold War era, globalization to take place. It's the backdrop of all financial and commercial transactions of an international nature. It, it, it has succeeded so admirably that we don't notice it, but it is what has allowed trillions of dollars to produce goods and services and to move money back and forth 
it, every contract has an arbitration clause which allows third-party adjudication of disputes, the fundamental issue of governance to take place. And it's taken place because the international business community sees a benefit in doing it. And very few instances have any countries challenged it in the area of environment, in the area of security, in the area of human rights, we see sovereigns pulling out. But in the area of finance, in the area of commerce, this treaty has become strengthened even in the midst of the current crisis. So I do think we see a model uh, that, that can work, but we haven't made the case for the other issues in which fragmentation has occurred. What's your response to that? Well, I'm I'm just the moderator, so uh, I, I think I I, I should not should re not really yeah yeah. But um, I would like to ask you whether or not you think those rules are uh, or institutions are really enforceable in 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 these times of uh, geopolitical shifts and, and conflicts. The business community has enforced it by, and the financial community has enforced it. When any nation has challenged it, there's been a capital flow out of that country. So the challenges sure. to it have been few and far between. Uzbekistan did at one point. But the challenges have been few and far between, and we've seen the integration of the system through that treaty as being very robust, and it hasn't even been affected by the current breakdown. So um, no, there's no Leviathan. And the international system doesn't have the, there are in, there are not instances of disputes going before the International Court of Justice, for example, because the economics of it compel business to adhere to it. I I, I heard that that term the first time some some days ago. It's called minilateralism. Have you heard of it? It it means that uh, smaller groups are able to set new rules. So we, we do not need that idea of multilateralism, but uh, we, we start, we restart from a group of uh, quite stable ideas of, of rules. But I, I would like, to, uh, I would like to, to catch some other questions. Over there, there was another question, please. Nicolas Vasilakos from the University of East Anglia. Thank you for your very insightful talks. I would like to uh, pick on a point from Mr. Mora towards the end of your talk, sir. You said that um, uh, these, well, the ECB should stay out of uh, focusing on climate policies and the impacts of climate policies. Um, but essentially, um, the impacts of climate change and the policies that are put in place to mitigate that, uh, these impacts and adapt to these impacts are pro strongly pro-inflationary. So can central banks, I'm not thinking specifically of ECB, but in general, central banks, can they really stay out of this debate? Thank you. Should I immediately? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I was busy with that question before in my previous capacity as deputy governor of the Czech National Bank a lot. Well, you are of course right. There are many risks which we take into, which we, we as economists, or before when I was a monetary policy maker, into account, including, I don't know, fiscal policy, demography, many issues. But you do not take a position as a central bank on a demographic development. You do not say to the government how should they promote or not uh, reproduction policy or uh, you know something like that. But we did it a lot in in the field of climate, and there I think uh, for me at least this is a big question mark, because I also think that we gave to people the wrong impression that the central bank can resolve the issue of climate change, which it cannot and should not. This is what I am saying. Maybe, well, and the same, by the way, applies well, to a, lot of, a large extent also to the IMF, which also gave this, in my view, wrong impression. Of course, climate policy and demographics and I don't know what is, is uh, important for the global financial order, etc. but, you know, the institution is not there to solve this problem. Uh, Franz Nauschnick, formerly Austrian Central Bank, now uh, ELEC, uh, European League of Economic Cooperation. My question is, you mentioned return of industrial policy. I would argue industrial policy has not been away 
because China always did industrial policy. If we look at the solar panels uh, uh, mm. 15 years ago, 80% of the production was in Germany, now it's 80% in uh, China. And uh, we see the same happening now with electric cars, uh, where the Chinese uh, industrial policy is quite successful. The US is reacting and Europe is, how should I uh, say, trying to get its act together. Because if two uh, office blocks are doing industrial policy, if you are not doing industrial policy, you are lost. Rules and uh, it could be could turn as a threat to the single European market, but that's just can my. <laughs> who wants to answer, can, please? Can I say something on? Uh, I think uh, finding uh, the right balance in terms of industrial policies is extremely difficult, and at uh, the European level, I think uh, that's uh, what we have uh, to consider. And I agree that uh, there may be some uh, some uh, need of uh, defensive strategies uh, um, to take place but on the other side what i'm uh, striked about is uh, that in the current uh, discussion uh, even uh, when there was a uh, discussion on the inflation reduction <coughs> act etc nobody comes out uh, on uh, an industrial policy for what and also in which kind of technologies. I remember when I was uh, studying at a university, we always made the case that it's difficult, different if you talk about mature technologies or uh, innovative technologies. And here we have uh, the solar panel is an example. I think a solar panel are the super mature technologies. So why do we want them to be produced in Europe? What's the upside of having a massive production if we can get the solar panel in Europe? And uh, if uh, we have enough diversification, but uh, there is the diversification side. Otherwise, uh, producing them uh, in Europe and paying it uh, double, because uh, they will cost uh, double, I don't think it's, uh, it's an industrial policy that uh, we should develop. So uh, for Europe in this moment, I think it's extremely important uh, to be very, very targeted. Uh, our model uh, is different. Maybe we have uh, more uh, the, the globalization uh, uh, nature in, <laughs> in, uh, in what we do, etc. and uh, avoid entering in uh, protecting every single sector uh, just because uh, they are important or because uh, the production is coming from China and try to really make it uh, very, very targeted. Uh, and uh, that's why I was uh, saying, uh, I think uh, the, the, the real market failure uh, remain on the innovation point of view, and uh, we know there are market failure on innovation. Maybe there is uh, something on diversifying the value chains, uh, but not uh, just uh, protecting uh, from everything uh, that comes from China or, uh, or others. That's on my side. Uh, Gabriel, confl conflicting interest with well, trade and industrial well, policy. On the, one, on the one hand, I very much agree uh, with you on, on focusing on R&D, uh, but um, I'm a little bit skeptical when it comes to cherry-picking industries, yes. even <laughs> narrowly, right? Because we see those lists of cherry-picked professions. In, in Austria, we have the Mangelbüros oh no, list. You know, what are the professions that are you know, where we need more immigration, that list grows longer, longer, longer. The raw materials lists of the European Commission grows longer, longer, and longer. At the end, everything's strategic, and then uh, uh, we are where Otilia uh, doesn't want us to be, you know, with lists that don't help us, because everything's strategic. And the thing is that things change all the time, no? Uh, cobalt uh, was scarce two or three years ago, a year ago, a couple of months ago, The Economist uh, had, had an article, Cobalt now being super abundant. Uh, so, I mean, this is, I think it's hopeless. No? And uh, therefore, what uh, I strongly believe is the best, the best policy, really, is to target industrial policy, um, not towards certain industries, but to certain, to certain key ingredients of what well, we know this is important for any industry, <laughs> no? That means good infrastructure. That mean, and I'm talking about not just uh, roads, no, um, uh, good, Education. good uh, regulation, hmm? and where we do know that there are market failures in the area of R&D, for example, we need to do much more. But then give give the R&D uh, subsidies, no, out okay. in a competitive fashion, no, so that not have commissions, you know, people like us sitting on a green table and saying, oh, we, we, we put these and these billion euros to that firm, no? but have a mechanism that, that helps us uh, 
that helps us spread those subsidies so that they are useful for everyone. And uh, without going into the need of cherry picking, you know, that, that is, is old, fa old fashioned, you know, but um, my worry is that it uh, at the end costs a lot of money. If you talk to insiders of the semiconductors industry about Intel, the 10 billion that the German government wanted to give out to them, let's see whether they still can uh, yes, after yes. Karlsruhe. But you know, many insiders say this is completely insane because there's a world market for, for semiconductors and uh, the price of, it's the price that matters. No? And uh, Intel will sell where the price is highest and so we don't gain, what do we gain? Yes. No? And so, as, and, but if we, ha if we had world leading universities, really, you know, that, uh, that um, push the frontier, that would make a change. No? And we, sh we should make sure that the money is going there rather than wasting it on shareholders of US companies. If that's industrial policy, I think this is the yeah. most stupidest thing that we could do. Wow. We have time for one more and final question, please. Thank you very much. My name is Urban Rusnak. I'm coming from Slovakia. I'm dealing with energy and connectivity for some time. So I, I have one observation on one question. I think I completely agree with what Gabriel just said. I think we need, in Europe, we need to focus to support innovation and research and development of a, of a society and the the how to say environment to, to boost to boost our development capabilities. Uh, on the contrary, I'm afraid of over regulations. I think we, we are running too many regulations on the European level. And as Otilia mentioned, those uh, European regulations are often transformed into 27 different regulations at national level and we are creating a mess and actually pushing the innovation out of European Union. Uh, my observation, I mean, it's just an observation. I have a question. So something I would like to add to the debate about the China's industrial policy and link to the, uh, to the successes of, uh, of green energy transformation. We often used to complain in Europe that while the China, through the investment, uh, the investment into the industrial policy, stole the solar manufacturing, now there's a, the uh, battery industry, the electric vehicles, and so on, so on. So I think... On one hand, this may be really the case because we, they are really investing hard to, to make this all infrastructures, all environment, all ecosystems for the different cherry picking industries. On the other hand, due to this in Chinese investment to solar panels, just for example, so we can have this enormous boost of solar industry across the world because this is the way how they pushed the price and the cost for everyone mm -hmm. much, much lower than would have been in, pr produced and manufactured in Europe. So we were never able to get this level of mm -hmm. cost and cheap, efficient, dirty, cheap solar panels. As I mentioned, yes, this is, as we stand with policy, we compare, this is a mature technology. So there should be a new, new sort, new, new physically based panels for, for, uh, for photovoltaic industry, not the current ones. But probably this is a role what the Europe should play and really not to look and not to be envy about China investing on a technology which are already mature because they're actually making the economy of scale we could be never able to achieve in Europe. Thank you. I would like to give that question to you, Jose, if you like, uh, because I think the question of technologies also deal with uh, the concept of foresight. So when it comes to artificial intelligence, we do not really know how to deal with that yeah. and what is the regulatory framework we mm -hmm. can yeah. properly... Uh, um, we agree with, uh, with that claim. In fact, um, uh, also it, it goes in the same direction that the claim of the solar panels, etc. right? Um, I think the idea that the idea is not only to focus on the strategic sectors or only not to focus on the strategic services, etc. But it's true that the, these kind of things change, etc., etc. But uh, be ready. Be ready for, for, the, uh, for avoid the vulnerabilities that we will face in the near, in the midterm or in the long term. And in the case of the solar panels, in the case of, of energy, and in many things that are necessary for the energy, energy transition, the thing is not to... Uh, that Europe assumes now the idea to uh, start to produce solar panels. But the idea is to, if it's necessary, have the tools to produce solar panels because of, you know, the, uh, the energy change, the risk of uh, uh, the, 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 pro the, 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 the acceptance of uh, decarbonization, et cetera, et cetera. So this is basically the, 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 the thing that uh, Europe needs to assume. 
uh, Europe needs to, to follow the, the path of, uh, uh, you know, identify this, this, kind, this kind of things because, because in, in the near future will be uh, very relevant. And instead, they are relevant today. Uh, 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 you know, uh, um, uh, the, the, that's true that the geopolitics is, is, is changing. The, the aggression of Russia, uh, it's, it's something that we need to take in, in a serious way. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we need to respond to that. So I'm afraid time is almost up and I would like to, to skip uh, the concluding remarks because th there are no concluding remarks. It's an ongoing an open discussion. So thanks a lot uh, to the panelists. Thanks a lot for your valuable contributions.